final speaker has a very special place in my heart. <laughs> and partially it is because I blame her for starting this company. <laughs> I was operating a VOSO in somewhat anonymity until she came along and we worked together and she did her TEDx Boulder 2013 talk called Coming Out of Your Closet. She then proceeded to blow up the internet. <laughs> and millions of views later, she is now one of the top 10 TEDx talks of all time. So the woman, the legend, Ash Beckham, sorry, freedom. All right, Boulder, final push, here we go. <laughs> so uh, back in January, I was driving into downtown Boulder and I was uh, meeting this group of speakers actually. It was this beautiful day, unseasonably warm. Uh, gorgeous out, I'd just taken the dog for a walk, had a hot cup of coffee, I was singing to the radio on my way down, and I'm driving down and uh, I get a left arrow. So I don't even miss a Beyonce lyric as I start to make the turn. <laughs> and all of a sudden this maniac coming from the other direction pulls right in front of me, almost hits me. And so I lay on my horn and give him a, <laughs> through my windshield, and proceed to drive. And, and I do not call myself a honker per se, but I had the arrow, man. So I pull in front of him and pull into the parking garage and he pulls into the parking garage right behind me. And for the first two levels, I'm not even looking for a spot. I'm just shooting him eye daggers through my rear view mirror. And I'm making my way up and it's bolder. It, nine o'clock on a weekday, so there's no spot. So we keep driving up, and about the third level, I'm like, oh, this reminds me of this really annoying intersection, about three blocks up, where two cars come in from the same way, and they both hit a one way, and both of them have an arrow. Well, do you think that guy had an arrow? <laughs> and what kind of world do we live in where two people coming from the opposite direction both have a green arrow at the same time? <laughs> so I realize uh, that my, traffic high horse no longer stands and we make our way up to the top level and the only, um, the only spots are two of them right next to each other. <laughs> and I am so attached to my traffic superiority that I get out of the car and fake like I'm on a phone call. <laughs> and I say, hey, do you, have you talked to any other suppliers? Because I'm sure we can get a better rate than that. I don't, even, I don't even know what that means. That doesn't even mean anything to me. But I was in panic mode. So I get in the car and sell my phone, which is funny that like, I still do a phone like this. I'm sure kids are like this or this, but anyway, it's still a phone to me. So I'm, on, so I'm on the phone and I don't see the guy, so I figure crisis averted. And I scurry over to the stairwell and hit that first step. And there he is, the smug right turner. And I am waiting for my deserved scolding for honking at someone at 9 a.m. in Boulder. And he just says, isn't it ridiculous that we both had green arrows? We gotta call the city about that. Have a good day. <laughs> so tonight I'm gonna talk to you about the art of taking a stand. We're taught that taking a stand is something that is just definitive. Either you do or you don't. Either you're William Wallace, <laughs> and you fight to the death on your principle, or you're Elsa and you just let it go. <laughs> but I think that is a really archaic model. I mean, that means that if I don't have the perfect 15 second soundbite to someone's racist joke or sexist comment that I'm relegated to cowardly bystander in the corner, and I just don't think life works like that. It's way more nuanced. We live in a world where we are all individuals and I think taking a stand is an art. And just like art, it's individual and people can do it as they see fit and we all have the power to express it in any way that we want. So back to that garage. You can imagine that scene, but I'm gonna take you inside my brain really quickly, which is sometimes a bizarre place, but work with me. It is, uh, we all kind of have the same brain chemistry basically. So. I'm there and uh, I have this threat. Is it real, is it perceived? It doesn't really matter. I mean, first maybe we we're gonna hate each other, maybe my life was in danger, probably not, it's bolder, it's like 30. 
miles an hour here. So, uh, so it wasn't, but then my sense of moral rightness around traffic etiquette was at stake. So there is this threat. And this sets off a chain reaction of chemical releases in my brain. And there's all kinds of chemicals flying around there, but we're going to focus on two groups. We're going to focus on the happy hormones and the stress hormones. So the happy hormones are like oxytocin and serotonin. That's what we get after we get a hug or have a baby or uh, work out. Those are the ones that make us feel good. They make us socially interactive, um, trusting, and empathetic. These are released from the limbic brain or the neocortex. Those are kind of our two, two places where that comes from. The reptilian brain, on the other hand, is way more reactive. That just releases adrenaline and cortisol, to name a couple, and those start flowing into our body. Those are the hormones that happen when you see something down your hallway and you're like, is that an intruder or my coat rack? I don't really know. <laughs> But the stress hormones are essentially the honey badgers of hormones. They do not care. They do whatever they want. They figure out if it's a coat rack later. And these hormones come from our reptilian brain. So there are three distinct advantages that the reptilian brain and the stress hormones have over the happy hormones, right? And in this battle that happens between them, this a uh, chemical war that's happening in your brain. Whoever wins that dictates your reaction. So first of all, <laughs> the, happy or, or the stress hormones have been around for about 500 million years. Do you think this guy cares about being politically correct? No, he's just trying to stay alive. <laughs> the second advantage is that the stress hormones are instant. They release as soon as there's an event, right? So imagine somebody popping a balloon behind you. You jump before you even know what happened. It takes a second, even if it's a split second, for you to be able to reason that it was just a balloon. And the third advantage is that uh, neural pathways are like ruts in a road. They're more the, the more they are traveled, the more direct and efficient they become. So if we live a stressful life or don't expose ourselves to new unknowns, our default becomes fight or flight. And when we're talking about ruts, ruts can be physical, emotional, psychological. Do you take the same way home from work every day and not even think about your turns? That's a rut. Do not challenge your boss when he says an offensive comment, that's a rut. Do not stand up for peers when you hear microaggressions against them, that's a rut. And we know what it's like to be in a rut, right? But what does it feel like to get out of a rut? So we're gonna do a little experiment right now. I want everybody to just sit back and relax and cross their arms. Come on, cross your arms. Okay, now I want you to take your arms and put the opposite one on top. That, my friend, is getting out of a rut. The first time I did that, I was like, these aren't even my arms. What is happening? <laughs> but the more you do it, the more comfortable it gets. You find comfort in the discomfort. You have an ability to stay in the awkward, and it's the same with taking a stand. The first time you do it, it is an out-of-body experience. But the more you do it, those pathways get routed more and more directly, and the things that you're gaining from taking a stand far outweigh the risks that are actually involved. So when we're having this positive feedback, it makes us willing to do it more often. So um, back in March, I was at a rural college uh, over on the East Coast, and I was talking to an LGBTQ group, and we are talking about issues on campus, and uh, we had a little meeting outside at their quad, and they had their rainbow flag out, uh, and this couple guys walked by. We would call them sweatshirt guy and backwards hat guy. <laughs> <laughs> they walk by and say, you know, the Bible says Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. <laughs> and I was like, all right, here we go. And you can see the, the reptilian reaction among the group of people that I'm with. And, and they were college students, so you didn't expect them to be too well seasoned in this. But uh, the, you know, a couple of the kids puffed their chest and prepared their responses, and several of the other people um, just kind of looked at their phones and avoided eye contact. And I figured the last thing these guys were expecting uh, was a conversation. And there is something incredibly intriguing about wanting to change someone's mind. So I was like, well, tell me more about that. Come on over. Let's chat. And so we go back and forth in banter Bible, Bible verses, which I'm limited to like two. 
So that didn't really go that well. But we went for a while, and we, we were having no reconciliation uh, about it. And then sweatshirt guy goes, you know, when my mom always told me, when you set the dinner table, there's one spoon and one fork, and, and that's just it. There's never two spoons or two forks. And it was really hard for me <laughs> to not go down the culinary rabbit hole with him and be like, Sometimes you have a soup spoon or perhaps, perhaps a salad fork, but it really wasn't working with this guy. So he's like, it's a spoon or a fork. It's a spoon or a fork. What are you? Are you a spoon or a fork? And so I, I you know, was originally trying to engage in this, but now it was becoming personal. I certainly didn't feel threatened, but my entire character, my identity was being questioned by this guy. So I can feel my honey badger hormones coming on pretty strong. My face is getting red, I'm clenching my fists, and I'm about to lay into this dude when backwards hat guy goes, dude, some people are just sporks. <laughs> He's a spork, just let it be. And I am so amped up that I turn and I'm about to go off on backwards hat guy. You are not helping. <laughs> First of all, you just called me he. Second of all, your obsession with gender binary is exactly what I am fighting right now. And why are we still talking about utensils and do you guys not have chopsticks here? <laughs> but before I can say anything, backwards hat guy, or sweatshirt guy, they're confusing. Sweatshirt guy goes, oh, he's a spork. Well, I guess sporks are kind of cool. <laughs> what? Sometimes you get to pick your allies, and sometimes your allies pick you. And I could have talked to sweatshirt guy till I was blue in the face, and we wouldn't have gotten anywhere. But backwards hat guy, he got to him with the spork thing. Now, did I want to be a spork? No. I mean, I get it, round face, spiky hair, it's fine. Like, I appreciate that as a concept. <laughs> but it didn't matter if it made sense to me. It mattered that it made sense to sweatshirt guy. For the first time ever, he looked at things differently. He looked at me differently. And I stopped being a threat. And everyone calmed down. Are we able to get out of our reptilian brain long enough to understand and appreciate that the vast majority of our personal interactions are not life and death, they're just uncomfortable. And can we exist in the uncomfortable long enough to have a conversation? If we can remove the fear of the unknown from the equation, the reptile can rest and reason can reign. So let's get back to our brains for a second. So there were three things that gave our reptilian brain and our stress hormones advantages. One, they've been around longer. Two, the release of the chemical is instant. And three is the ruts. The only thing we can really control is the ruts, right? And that is the beauty of our brain, neuroplasticity. The ability to fire new pathways, to force our brain to work in different ways, and that comes from exposure to things we've never seen. It comes from being uncomfortable and taking a stand is uncomfortable. But you don't have to be king of the comebacks to take a stand. You don't even need words to take a stand. Can you take a stand and just give somebody a hug? Can you take a stand and just listen? Can you take a stand and just be a shield? You don't need to be a wordsmith to be a warrior. You just need to be brave enough to stay. So. Martin Luther King said, in the end, we will not remember the words of our enemies, but rather the silence of our friends. So I vow to you now, I will not be silent. I will be awkward, and I will be uncomfortable, and I will be offensive, and I will be criticized, but I will not be silent. I will have conversations with my friends of color about race despite my whiteness, and I will have conversations about religious freedom, even though I'm not devout. And I will have conversations about immigration, even though 
I am a citizen. And I will dive into questions and listen to answers about biases I have never known. And that comes from a desire to be part of the conversation. And my street credibility may not come from my exact direct personal experience, but it comes from the experience of being a human. And I will not assume that my privilege gives me the answers to all of the questions, but rather the power and the responsibility to advocate on behalf of those that are marginalized. And I might not say it perfectly or as poignantly as I wished, but I will take a stand and I will stay no matter how uncomfortable it becomes. Because taking a stand is an art, and art is messy, and there's no progress that comes from a blank canvas. Thanks, you guys. Have a great night.